So today we, uh, <clears throat> actually on Saturday, we already entered on Vasa. And uh, uh, Saturday, yeah. That means uh, we'll be here, f I'll be here for three months, three lunar months, at least uh, for now. So I was thinking, so now is the beginning of Vasa, then I, I would like to dedicate this uh, these talks to to the to the late Saranya Ponika, yeah? Mahatera. <clears throat> now he passed away in Kathmandu last year on the third of July. Yeah? And and sometimes uh, while he's alive and when he's here in Malaysia, uh, I I I asked him, I asked him, um, Saido, how do you like to die? <laughs> and I, I know some of you may find this uh, question offensive, yeah? especially if I were to ask to you, and then it may, you may find it very offensive. But for us monks, uh, and this question is very casual, a quick casual talk. Yeah? Uh, it's a casual talk. So hopefully you all don't find it too offensive. Nah? After all, we, after all, we've been thinking of death all the time here and there. Nah? Yeah. Not this is not just once. Nah? This is I asked him a number of times over the years. Nah? <clears throat> he told me that he told me that he would like to die the way that when, because he met some of his, some devotees in Kamandu or in Nepal, and he said that he mentioned that, you know, if I were to die, I don't want to, I mean, if I were about to die, I don't want to trouble people. And also if I could able to die, I would like to die when I sleep at night and tomorrow I don't wake up anymore. <laughs> yeah. And I don't wake up anymore. And then do whatever you want with the body. Yeah. <clears throat> but the thing is that his wish was not fulfilled, you know. Uh, because he died uh, after surgery, I think. And we, I mean, we, we can't be there last year because of all this lockdown. Yeah? Nevertheless, over this one year, past, past one year, every time, sometimes I thought of him and so on, yeah? I have a feeling that his death, uh, I mean, this is my feeling, I think his death is untimely, you know. Not his time yet. But maybe because of what we call a destructive karma comes in uh, and take over. Yeah. But this is my feeling, uh, you know. After all, death is death. Whether you have destructive karma or you've got to prolong your life a little bit, it's going to come. Uh. But nevertheless, something inside my heart has always felt that it's slightly, it's something untimely. Could I able to confirm it? I don't think so. <laughs> it's just a hunch. Yeah? <clears throat> anyway, this this picture, this picture, what you see here in the, yeah, this was the taken on in the, where was it? Cameron Highlands. Yeah? That was a 2019 in somewhere in June. Now, that was the last trip he came, I think. I don't, yeah, that was the last trip. All right. So every now and then also I mentioned some of his uh, some of his encouragement, his talks, you know, into my into my talks also. Yeah? So we'll carry on with the Dhamma talk. Yeah? <clears throat> All right. Or oh, maybe I, maybe, 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 wait, wait, wait. 
don't like this, huh? Okay, take this then. All right, for a change. <clears throat> okay, so what's the talk for tonight? Oh yes, on mindfulness. Hmm. So last week we were talking about, last week and the week before that we were talking about wisdom factor. And I said that this wisdom factor, you need a lot of, you need a very consistent, continuous type of mindfulness. In order for the, when the condition is there, only then you can able to exercise that precision of noting. Uh, if you don't, if you don't have that mindfulness and you don't have that continuous mindfulness, then that that wisdom factor will be lacking or will be weak. Uh, so it's, it's important for us to understand that. Uh, uh, so I give you a number of things that you have to slow down. You have to, you have to do what. Your walking meditation, you have to repeatedly do it again and again, all these things. Uh, uh, then it is, then only we can have that type of continuity of that mindfulness. Then only that wisdom factor can able to arise. Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, okay, now let us go to the faculty of mindfulness. Now, this faculty of mindfulness, uh, it will not be the same as when we begin to talk about mindfulness. Now, co co coincidentally, you know, when I was delivering the talk on mindfulness somewhere in March, uh, it was also a dedication to my lay Dhamma teacher also. Yeah, that was somewhere in March. Yeah. And so happened that it was also the talk on mindfulness. But that mindfulness that we are talking in the in a aspect of the right mindfulness in the sense of the noble eightfold path, that time I touch on it is more um more say like the you know, more for beginners, you know and more for beginners. But this time when we talk about this faculty, this is not really meant for beginners. But since you are a beginner and you stay here, please don't go, you know. <laughs> not I'm chasing you away, but it's going to be a little bit more than, than uh, normal what you understand as mindfulness. When it manifests as in the deeper practice, then it has a diff... It's not to say that it's different, but something that you have not seen it before, something you have not felt that way before. But at least maybe you have a, a rough idea you know, about how this mindfulness, when it develops into a more deeper aspect, deeper stages, how when it becomes continuous, how it becomes deep, you know, how it changes our, our, our way of doing things and the way of we looking at things, many things that's going to come in. You know? So here, here we're going to look into it a little bit more. Okay? All right. So let us go to the sharing of screen. Huh? <clears throat> now, first of all, we're going to look into the <clears throat> into this chart again. No? Now here we are already touching on mindfulness. We already covered on faith and on wisdom huh? as a faculty and also as a power. Now here, as when you come as the mindfulness of, as a faculty, here what it means that uh, mindfulness in a rough idea, huh? in a, later we're going to present it a little bit more. Here means continuous presentness. I wonder whether my word here is also correct or not, the word presentness. Because some of us may think that the word presentness is just, eh? are you here or not? Uh, you are here. Yeah, are you listening to the talk? Uh, you are here. Uh, not really that type of presentness or so. It's much more deeper than that. 
Yeah, it's more deeper than that. Yeah. It's not just that the whole part where you are just there in the present only. It's got a lot of more deeper meaning to it. Yeah. Because I said this upatana has a, has a, the part here has a energy involved. Yeah. Oh, energy involved, has an effort involved. Effort here, it's, it's, it's a really st strong effort, but it's a very well-balanced effort. Uh, not, something, not something where you are here, although you are present, but you are not much of a, not much of a, you know, much of a, that deep type of effort, uh, which is the, the second faculty. Uh, we haven't touched on it yet. Uh. So, so the the whole faculty is means that there's a continuity of that mindfulness, the state of mind which is uh, really deep in the sense of that presentness. Uh, <clears throat> then, as a power, uh, this it opposes this heedlessness or the word the word pamada, uh, negligence. Or heedlessness. That means you go into unwholesome mental state or unwholesome action or unwholesome speech. And that mindfulness, when it's become a power, it stopped you. Or it just pushed those unwholesome act, speech, or action aside. <clears throat> We don't see it as a power yet right now because if because first of all the mindfulness is not strong and it's not continuous. Yeah. It's only when you are deep into the practice then you can really see how the mindfulness can stop you from, from all this unwholesome state negligence. Yeah. Yeah. Normally Normally, when we say that we are um, avoid all this unwholesomeness, we think about our precept. We think about our precept. We think about the first uh, precept or oh, avoid killing. I saw, okay, my precept here is to avoid that killing. Now, to avoid that killing, we think of the precept, then we don't do it. Uh, that is also, again, is a kind of uh, heedful, you are being heedful. That means there are certain degree of mindfulness inside it. Although this time the mindfulness is slightly at the background, the thinking about the precept is at the foreground of your mind. And then that's, that, that thinking of the precept is the sense of moral shame and moral dread or hiri and otapa. And then those are at the foreground. Yeah. But while you are meditating, uh, uh, while you are meditating, and when it becomes continuous, then this mindfulness becomes at the forefront. Becomes at the forefront in that it prevents you to go into all kinds of unwholesomeness. Even that slight laziness that you want to, you know, sort of going to lie down or you want to have a drink, you know, that type of mindfulness stops you from doing all kinds of things which is unnecessary. Not just only whether it is uh, wholesome or unwholesome, yeah, but unnecessary. Sometimes like, for example, just a small example like when we are doing in a deep practice. Uh, and sometimes for, for you, some people is that you want to take a drink. When you want to take a drink, you just go without whether that is necessary or not. To you, it may not be nothing unwholesome, nothing, nothing, what's wrong with it after all, you know? Just taking a drink on here. But when you are in the actual deep practice, the mind consider a little bit more. Is that taking a drink necessary right now? If it's not necessary, 
we put it aside, continue the meditation, continue the sitting, continue the walking, even the taking of that drink, as simple as that. While we are in the everyday life right, right, right now when we are not meditating, all these things is just so automatic. And we don't even consider it and we just go on into it every day. But while you are in the meditation, in the deep meditation, uh, that little bit also uh, is being considered by that mindfulness. Uh, so that mindfulness, it prevents the negligence or the heedlessness. And sometimes the heedlessness comes in as uh, comes in as uh, uh, what do you call that? Neg come in as laziness. Uh. Uh, that negligence are uh, coming as laziness. Uh, so you've got to take note of it. Yeah? So you've got to take note of this, this type of uh, uh, happenings uh, while you are meditating. Don't underestimate these small little things that uh, got nothing to do with your meditation. Uh, everything. Uh, so to just give you a rough idea. Uh, to give you a rough idea. Now we're going to elaborate things a little bit more, a little bit more further. Yeah? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> now, as I said, this mindfulness, this satindriya, yeah, is because, and we look at it, as I said, this is not a beginner's mindfulness. Sometimes in the beginning mindfulness, you may be thought to be just be present. Uh, you're able to recollect. Uh, you're able to remember, things like that. Uh. Whereas sometimes the word sati, in a certain part of the suttas, uh, they are used as to remember, to recollect your past memory. Uh, the word sati itself. Uh. So, Generally, we can use the word sati as memory to able to recollect the memory and also the presentness of mind. Yeah? But when we are doing sati patana, then we are using the sati in the meaning of the presentness of mind. Yeah? So when we are talking, like for example, talking to each other in if it's in Pali, you know, <laughs> then we can use the word sati as to remember the past. Yeah? <clears throat> even to remember the past, uh, uh, even to remember the past, that means uh, well, the, the, the past, that means you have to be present also. That particular past, that means you have to do something, remember, you have to be very present in order for your future to remember you or to remember that past. Yeah. If your mind is not really that present, then the future cannot be able to remember. That means now you cannot remember the past. Yeah. So that means there's also some degree of presentness also. But anyway, this is how the Pali is being used. Okay, But here, when we talk about the faculty of mindfulness, as in the meditation, <clears throat> uh, then this is very important is to understand the word sati as, as, the, as the mindfulness of the presentness of the mind. Uh, <clears throat> now, the next one is the as a faculty again, then this faculty has to to fall under the objects of four foundation of mindfulness, uh, the four satipatthana, which is the objects of body, feelings, mind, and the Dhamma. <clears throat> now here, let me put it clearly. Uh, I put here the objects of four foundation of mindfulness. Uh, because in the satipatthana, the four foundation of mindfulness, they are not just only objects. The Buddha also mentioned how the mind states, how, how, how the states of mind has to be applied onto the object. That is also another section uh, of the, the Satipatthana Sutta. Okay? The mind state, how the mind states, 
how the strong, clear mind state to be applied onto the object of the four foundation of mindfulness. So there are two different aspects here. One is the objects, like what you see, the body, feelings, mind, and the Dhamma. And one is the state of mind that pays attention, that observe the these four objects. Yeah. And then another aspect of the four foundation of mindfulness is the goal of the practice. So the goal here finally is to, you know, the Buddha put it as the purification of beings and so on until one realizes Nibbana. And so Nibbana is the objective or the goal of this four foundation of mindfulness. So the three of them has to come together forms the, the aspect of the four foundation of mindfulness. Yeah? So here you have the objects and therefore right now as a faculty of mindfulness, because the faculty of mindfulness here is the mental states, yeah? is the mental state as the noting mind that has to be fall on, has to be pay attention to the body, feelings, mind or dhamma. So, it has to fall into here in order to have that faculty. Therefore, therefore, with the development of that faculty, with the development of full development of the faculty, Nibbana is realized. Hmm? Yeah. So, we have to make this clear to all of you that this, this is, you have to put the mindfulness into the body, feelings, mind, and the Dhamma. We're gonna, no, we are not going to go into all this discussion on body, feelings, mind, and the Dhamma because it takes a lot, a lot of time to, to, and, I mean, to go through all of them. Yeah. Uh, now, the next thing is that <clears throat> I want to say that it is, you have to remember if you're out of these objects, or usually they, they use the word domain or the Pali word gochara, yeah? the domain, that means you're out of the boundary yeah, of these objects, uh, then it's not a faculty anymore. Yeah? Because it does not aid you or it doesn't help you in the sense of enlightenment. Yeah? Uh, now, let's, you see, <clears throat> the mindfulness here can be connected to a conceptual object. Conceptual object here can be any object, for example, like if you are doing metta, if you are doing in-breath, out-breath, as a samatha a method, you know. Uh, although these are conceptual objects, and also, for example, you are not, maybe not necessary of meditation also, but if you are reading, for example, you are reading, and you are reading the attentively onto the words, you know, and you are recalling it and and try to understand what is what is the meaning, then there's some degree of mindfulness there. There's some degree of attention there. Yeah. So so that type of mindfulness too, they are there. Yeah. Uh, for example, if not only just reading, but let's say you are doing things more carefully. Uh, doing things more carefully like uh, 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 say hot water. You have to we have to you have to deal with the hot water. You have to carry some hot water, and you have to carry more attentively. Yes, that also mindfulness. Uh, that is also a mindfulness, but it's not a faculty. It is mindfulness. Not to say it's not mindfulness, but it's not a faculty. Yeah? Uh, so it can be connected to a conceptual objects. Yeah. Uh, don't, don't ever think that mindfulness cannot connect it to conceptual objects. Now, therefore, when it concept, connected to conceptual objects, uh, that means when you are doing samatha meditation, you also need a lot of mindfulness. And you need a lot, a lot of mindfulness in order to keep the mind stabilized. Uh, to keep the mind stabilized. If you don't stabilize that Samatha object, then your Samatha objects will also be bombarded by all kinds of hindrances, all the hindrances. So you need mindfulness to stabilize the whole thing. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> 
during the Buddha's time, you know, when the but during the Buddha's time, when the ascetics, uh, not 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 just before the Buddha arises, uh, there are many ascetics also practicing samatha meditation, and they can also achieve all kinds of uh, supernormal powers. They can travel through air, go through the wall, and and do do a number of things. Therefore. Their mindfulness and their development also is very powerful. But they are not using that mindfulness for the purpose of enlightenment. Therefore, it is not a faculty because it does not aid the, the enlightenment. Now, if you are meditating, if you are doing some metta, then vipassana, and then sometimes metta again, vipassana again, and then sometimes you, you, you then change into anapana, and then you go into vipassana again, you know. Sometimes you change the, the, your method of your practice. Huh? And then with the back of your mind, with the intention, with the goal of finally is to end samsara. Therefore, that Samatha practice that you are doing, you know, in the way, you know, in general, we can consider that also as a faculty also. You know, we can consider that as a faculty. Although strictly speaking, it is not. But since you are mixing it, mixing Vipassana Samatha with a clear purpose that for the enlightenment, then can be considered as a faculty generally. Yeah. But if you are, but as I said, if you are practice with not for the enlightenment, for the happiness of the everyday life, or just for the psychic power and so on, uh, then it does not considered as a faculty. Yeah. So far, hopefully it's clear. Okay. Now, mindfulness again. The next one is it's where. When the faculty becomes, when the mindfulness becomes powerful, then there's a thing that is what we call equanimity or tatramajatata or upeka. Uh, I use the word equanimity because it's easier to understand. Easier to to understand. Uh. Now, before we we understand what is equanimity here, let us go back to mindfulness to understand the, at least its quality of the mindfulness when it's happening in the meditation. Then after that, we look into the equanimity. Yeah? All right. Characteristic here, not wobbling, that is not floating away from the object. Now here, I... All this, this one I I extracted out from from the from the Abhidhamma uh, by Abhidhamma Sangaha by translated by Bhikkhu Bodhi. You know, I just trans take it out and this one. A lot of times we may read about this, uh, but again, we we sometimes we don't know what is what is happening, what is going on here. Uh, uh. Now, characteristic here is not wobbling. Not wobbling here is not floating away from the object. That means this is not a superficial or mere awareness. You know? This is not just uh, 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 like, like for example, like you ask a, a young a young boy or a young girl, yeah. Okay, then you ask the young boy, hey, you put your palms together. Yeah. You put your palms together, and can you feel your palms? Then he says, yeah, I can feel the palm. Yeah. Although the mind, that one is present, uh, but it's not mindfulness yet now. It is not mindfulness. It is just a, uh, a perception is just a awareness of the everyday type of awareness that you just you put your awareness there and that's it. But that is not mindfulness. No, that is not mindfulness. So a lot of times when we everyday life, we have that type of so-called awareness. 
It doesn't turn into mindfulness. So when it turns into a mindfulness, is that your mind is more heightened up, heightened up in the sense that it knows the object, it knows whatever that you are doing much more clearer than what you are doing normally. Mm. So therefore, the word wobbling, that means it's not floating away. Then sometimes they, they use the word going to the object or sinking to the object. Yeah. Although I don't like to use the word sinking, because sometimes in the meditation, people have an idea of sinking into the object, has a very different idea to the yogi. You know. Yeah. Uh, again here, that means you are more your your awareness is much more heightened than your everyday type of awareness. Now, when there's a heightened, that means there's a sense, uh, some mindfulness there. At least there's a little bit there, <laughs> some degree there. Uh, uh, so, so here when we do um, walking meditation, for example, a lot of people do not know how to bring about even that mindfulness in the walking meditation. Yeah? Yeah. Because why? They don't do it carefully. They don't do it respectfully. They don't do it with the, with the sense of you know, the mind that is all, in, all there with the movement of the body. It is not. It's like, Right step, left step, then the mind run here, run there, run everywhere. Then therefore, the mindfulness after you're done for, for some time, uh, your mindfulness is not going to come up. I mean, not to say that it won't come up, but it's always in the weak side. You know? That means it's weak, that means it's easily disappear. It come for a while, disappear. Come for a while, disappear. It cannot sustain. It cannot sustain. We want it to sustain. In order for the mindfulness to go deeper, it needs to be sustained, it needs to be continuous. To have mindfulness is one thing, to sustain conscious, to sustain the mindfulness is another thing. Yeah? Now, where the sustaining of that mindfulness comes in is also with the help of the wisdom factor. Yeah? It's the help of the wisdom factor. If you're more precise in your noticing, uh, you find that your Mindfulness become more continuous. Your awareness become more continuous. Your deep awareness become more continuous. So it's not just mindfulness only. We want it to become continuous mindfulness. So when it's continuous mindfulness, then you see the characteristic of not wobbling. That means it's not superficial easily. It, it can stay with the object very clearly. All these characteristic function manifestation, uh, it when they show you in the Abhidhamma or they, when they describe this thing to you, or sometimes then the teachers describe these things to you, this type of understanding, you have to understand it from a deeper aspect of it, not just on the mere surface of understanding uh, of that nature of that mindfulness. It has a much more deeper than what we than what we um, when what we do everyday life. Huh? So not wobbling. I mean it's really goes in a deep heightened type of awareness, not just any form of awareness. Huh? Now <clears throat> the function here is the absence of confusion or non-forgetfulness or non hit or hit non-hitlessness. Huh? Again here, the word heedlessness, uh, again, it turns into a power, just like over here, negligence of heedlessness. Uh, it prevents unshaken, unshaken by that heedlessness. Uh. So here is, let, let, let's, let's put it, uh, non, non heedlessness easier to see. Okay. Uh, non heedlessness here, that means when it comes into a power, that mindfulness, it cannot be shaken by the unwholesome thoughts, unwholesome action, unwholesome this one. Even that slight laziness that I've mentioned earlier on, even that slight desire, even that slight discomfort and so on. Yeah? 
it's not shaken by those things. Uh, uh. For example, sometimes when you meditate, uh, there are days that you can able to, let's see, you can able to tahan the itchiness. You can able to withstand that itchiness. But some meditation, uh, you just have to scratch it. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why is that so that there are days you can able to take note of it, other days you cannot take, take note of it, you just have to scratch it in order to release that each. Mm -hmm. Because of that mindfulness, when the mindfulness is continuous, the mindfulness is strong, and that, that, uh, that slight aversion, that itchiness, that is unpleasantness does not affect you. Uh, that means that uh, your mind doesn't go into um, doesn't go into slight aversion or dissatisfaction or discomfort, you know, and the mind can be very clear of what is going on. Uh, that means it's also at the same time not confused. Not confused, it's not confused by the hindrances uh, on all the defilements of the mind. Uh, it's not confused by those things. That means the mind is clear. That means when the itchiness is there, the mind can just put the, the awareness can just drop there and it can able to withstand it. As if like the itchiness does not affect you at all. Now when you're able to do that, you know, you find that your mindfulness has developed, I mean, a little bit more. Like, yeah? But of course, this mindfulness uh, as all mental factors and all states of mind or body, they are all impermanence. They will, not, they will not stay. So you must keep on arousing them again. You must set up the condition, the right condition for them to arise. Huh? So this is what it meant here. So when it becomes this one, it becomes strong, it becomes clear. Huh? The word non-forgetfulness is not, again, this is not really the, uh, again, for, for our discussion here, it's not really the, past life or past events in, in, in those things, you know. So not in, in the sense of that forgetful. This is in the sense of you are not forgetful about your meditation object. And you, are, you are able to hold on to your meditation object and you are not forgetting about your meditation object. Because when you are away from that objects of the four foundation of mindfulness, then you go into the realm of Mara. Uh, the, all the, the, the hindrances will come and uh, uh, wrap you up nicely. <laughs> uh, so absence of confusion here. Uh, your mind is clear, the mind is aware. Okay. Now, the, <clears throat> the third one, uh, uh, manifestation as a guardianship. Now, manifestation here as a guardianship, what it meant over here is that it's protect you. Just like just now, and I said earlier on in the mindfulness, the guardianship here means it protect you from your going into all kinds of unwholesome state of mind. Huh? That means, where does it guard? It guards all the six senses. Mm. The guardianship is connected to the six senses. That is to say, for example, when you are walking meditation, uh, again, when you are walking meditation, you look at something. It so happened that there is a, 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 a cat passing through. Uh, then, if you are not mindful, your eyes are already turning into looking at the cat. And then you'll be thinking, Oh, is the cat hungry? Is the cat thirsty? Whose cat does it belong to? You know, then your mindfulness is all gone. <laughs> Why? Because your, your eyes has been, been attached to the cat and your thoughts start coming up already. And then sometimes I with that thoughts, I with a thought that, oh no, oh no, no, no. I think I'm more I'm compassionate. Oh, you think you're compassionate, huh? <laughs> You're not compassionate at right now. You are just 
you know, your your Mara just drag you out a little bit, and then you you let you think that you are compassionate. Yeah, no la. you are supposed to meditating. You are supposed to do whatever that you are supposed to doing right there. You're not going to get attracted to all kinds of things, even though those things are this one. Yeah? But then, of course, we must make a right judgment. Uh, you know, sometimes, of course, there's a certain situation we really need to help. Yeah? We really need to help. For example, like at one time, I was meditating. Meditate, meditate, meditate. And after that, I smell smoke coming out. Yeah? Smoke coming out, then people were running here and there. I just carry on meditate, lah, you know. Smoke my smoke low, smelling, smelling low, then rising, falling. Then after I open up my arm, my goodness, my at the back of me is it's already on fire. The forest is already on fire. And then the monks are trying to help. Then I stop my meditation, then go and help. Lah. <laughs> Cannot sit there too long after that. You know, the whole place will be will be um you know, engulfed in fire. We got to do something about it. So sometimes we have to make a uh, right judgment. So a lot of times it is not necessary. A lot of time is not necessary. All you need to do is just stay with your meditation. So this time, uh, when your mindfulness is very strong and clear, then when you stay with it, uh, that means you are not attracted by all kinds of sound that arises, or all kinds of sight that arises, or all kinds of comfort or the wind is blowing and touching your body, you don't attach to it. You still can able to notice onto your object of your meditation, not just enjoying there you know, with the with the cool sensation that is coming out on the body and all those things. Uh, you know, even you thought of your 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 thoughts that comes out in the past thoughts, you know, that are very happy past thoughts past memories, uh, it comes out and then this memory make you so happy and then you forget and then you fall into it and then it turns and turn you around here and there, let you relieve the whole story. That is where you out of it. So when there's a guardianship, when the mindfulness is strong and it's continuous, then the mindfulness prevent you from going into all these type of things and it makes then it keeps you staying with the object of your meditation. Yeah? So the guardianship here is very strong. Yeah. It's, it's not just moral shame and moral dread, you know, hiri otapa. It's not, they are not at the forefront, but this time the mindfulness at the forefront, it prevents you from going into all those unnecessary or unwholesome things. Yeah. Yeah. So is one thing as a guardianship. <clears throat> a state of confronting an objective field. Here again, when there's a mindfulness, it when the mindfulness is there, when there's heightened awareness, when there's a clear awareness, uh, it brings the whole attention and the uh, wisdom, the concentration, everything uh, to go near the object, go right in the front of the object or, or they use the word face to face with the object. Only when your awareness, only that, 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 sorry, only that attention is in front of that object or when it's close to the object, then it, then the other mental faculties, uh, all the other faculties can do their work. For example, when we discuss the wisdom, the wisdom can able to trash out, to discern the, the object, whether this object is hard, soft, whether the object is arising or disappearing, whether it's, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, whether it's change in this way or change in that way, you know. And so the, the wisdom needs to able to do that because the mindfulness is near the object, confronting the objective field. Uh, 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 this one, for example, confronting the objective field, uh, especially when you can see that sometimes yogis, uh, when it comes to a painful object, then when they are coming into a painful object, uh, they don't want to see the object closely. Uh, they want to see the object far, far away. 
when you see the object far, far away, uh, like like the pain come up already, uh, then you put in your mind, uh, okay, some people, some people taught me uh, that, oh, I must look at the pain uh, like one kilometer away, you know, put it as if in your mind uh, so far away. When you have that one kilometer away one, uh, you don't feel the pain one. Uh. Oh, somebody taught you like that. Then you go and try like that. Hey, yeah, yeah, you're correct. Huh? If I don't, I put it far, far away. Huh? Then not, not much pain. Huh? Which is true, and actually. Huh? But when you put the mind near to it, you try to pay attention to it. Oh, yo, the pain is so terrible, horrible. You curse the pain and whatnot. You know? Which is exactly what the mindfulness is. You put the mindfulness near to the pain. Everything is expanded. Now, everything is expanded, clear, because it's go near to that object. Now, if you put a mind far away, then you cannot see anything, nothing for you to notice. But when it comes into the rising and falling, uh, which is a neutral object, they want to put their mind very close to it. They want to go and see. But then, because of the mindfulness is not strong, they see pante, rising, falling, only little bit, little bit. After that, disappear. I sleep already. <laughs> <laughs> because your mindfulness is not strong because your mindfulness is, when the mindfulness is not strong it cannot go in front of the object then you cannot see anything else you know? no. so so when the object when the mindfulness go near to the object it can able to notice things very clearly you know? then the wisdom the concentration everything will come together so it needs that that uh, mindfulness it is manifestation because it can able to notice the object clearly what is going on as it being uh, discerned by the wisdom yeah? uh, the mindfulness is just to bring the object near the being sorry bring the attention or the faculties near to the object yeah? uh, okay the proximate cause here Strong perception or the four foundation of mindfulness. Okay. Now here, when we are doing vipassana, like what we are doing in especially in the Mahasi method, now we combine this strong perception and four foundation of mindfulness together. Yeah? Uh, take a simple example: is this, for example, when you say that okay, you are rising and falling not clear already. What else do you have to note? Ah, then you have to look for something which is more obvious, more prominent to you. The prominency here means strong perception. Okay, the prominence here tirasanya, then strong perception to you. That means you pay attention to the object that is stronger than the clearer than the rising and falling. Let's say the pain arises in the background. It's more clearer than the rising and falling. So what should you do? Then you bring your attention to the pain. Now, is it still fall under the four foundation of mindfulness? Then it is because the rising and falling is a bodily object. The pain is a feeling object. It's a one Vedana, no? it's a feeling object. So here you are changing from one front foundation to another foundation because of the and because of the prominency, then we do that. No? We and then it will come. It's easier for the mindfulness to come. No? <clears throat> then just now when I mentioned, you know, the earlier it says about the young boy, you put your palms together. Well, you notice your palm and you notice your sensation. <clears throat> not to say that you won't able to notice it. Nah. You, your mindfulness will not come. But at that moment, it's not come. It will not come. But if you repeatedly notice the hand touching uh, again and 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 again, then the mindfulness will come too. You know? But do you have the time, do you have the effort to do all these things? Uh, you know, most of the people don't have those things, don't have that time, don't have that effort. But if you really want to have that mindfulness that coming just by touching the palm, uh, you could. All you need to do is touching, 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 and you keep on noticing the sensation, uh, you know, not focusing on the words, you know, but noticing on the sensation again and again and again and again and again and again. It's just like you are polishing 
something is not sh shining, uh, then you keep on polishing, 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 polish. It will come sooner or later or shining also. But that one is much more slower method. Uh, much more slower method. It's good that we combine a strong perception and together with the object of the four foundation of mindfulness. Then only the mindfulness comes in much more faster and more continuous and the more continuous that means it's stronger if you're just using one object and you try to bring out the meditation uh, then it's it still can but it will take you a lot of time and for most people when your faculties you know when your past life you bring over in this life one uh, is not so strong and then it's going to be difficult for you for example there are meditation uh, the development of this mindfulness and also and so on. You look at object, whether they are clear or not clear, it doesn't matter. No? But if they still fall under the foundation of mindfulness, say for example, you notice a spot in the on the body. You notice a spot on the body, you notice that part. Then after that, you shift your attention to another part of the body. Then after that, after a while, you shift to another part, another part, another part, another part, another part, another part. Whether that object that you move from one part to another part, now, whether they are prominent to you or strong perception to you, whether they have that or not, it does not matter. All you need to do is just move from one object to another object to another object to another object to another object. To another object. Now, if you do that, not to say that you are wrong, you know, in the four foundation of mindfulness, you still have the, because you are still using the object, but practically it's going to be a bit more slower than if you are using a strong perception. You change according to the prominency of an object. Yeah. So there are people who do this type of meditation where they take just, they don't forget about the strong prominency, they just take the foundation for object of the four foundation of mindfulness, then they just use it like, for example, they want to know the different aspect of the cetasika, you know, they want to know from faith object and then what is mindfulness, what is this, is uh, what is pasadi, what is this and this and this and this and this. They take from one object to another object and like they go through the mind. So too, like there's some people right in the body, they want to know, okay, this is earth element first, this is this one and this is that one. Unless you're past life or you have developed something and then it can sorry it can come quite fast for most people it's going to be slow their mindfulness so you need strong perception together with the four foundation of mindfulness then things comes in much more faster that mindfulness so so therefore here when you are in a deep aspect of that mindfulness the mindfulness is very continuous the mindfulness does not run into all kinds of uh, unnecessary objects, you know, it stays with the meditation object and it's close noticing and clear of what is going on. And, and also at the same time, that mindfulness is very flexible in a sense, in a sense that it can move from one object to another object whenever the mind is, whenever the object is prominent, whenever the object is clear. Uh, then therefore it arouses even more that means there's a flexibility. The mind is very workable right now, you know. Uh, that also is something that we take note of because the mindfulness, when it's strong, uh, it's not really cha cha, you know, not like a bowl like that, you know, not like a tiang like that, you know. It's very flexible, it's very agile, and so on. Uh. Maybe uh, we'll talk about it also. Now, when it comes into Uh, when it comes into yeah, <clears throat> when it comes into equanimity, yeah, earlier on I mentioned that now. Uh, uh, where is it now? Uh? There is a one. This is mindfulness and equanimity when your faculty of mindfulness, when the faculty of mindfulness is there, because. The balancing part uh, actually done by equanimity, you know, not really done by mindfulness. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the nature of this equanimity is that it, you see, the characteristic of the mindfulness, that equanimity 
it's conveying consciousness and mental factors evenly. Yeah? Now, here, usually we use the word equanimity. I mean, it's usually Dhamma talk, you know, I use the word upeka or I use the word equanimity. But in the Abhidhamma, the, the, the term they use is called Tatra Majatata. Maja, Maja here means, you know the word Majima, yeah? middle length, middle. There's a middle, you know, there's a middleness here. Neutrality of mind, you know, has been translated, but the literal, translator, tran literal translation means something in the middle. Yeah? Yeah. So, so the need, middle here means equanimity. Equanimity as a mental factor, again, not as a feeling. Because sometimes in the Dhamma talk, uh, oh, sorry, not in the Dhamma, in the suttas, uh, you, you got to be careful. When you use the word equanimity, sometimes it can be a mental factor, sometimes it can be a feeling, uh, as a Vedana. You know? uh, mental factor here is under Sankara, if in the five aggregates. Uh, uh. So, equanimity here, we are looking at a mental factor, not as a feeling part of it. Now, it's conveying the consciousness and the mental factors evenly. Yeah? To prevent deficiency and excess or prevent partiality manifested as neutrality. That means when it's strong, when it's clear, the mind is very neutral. That means the mind is very balance. This is also important for us to take note. Yeah? Now here, uh, you see, you see, a lot of times we talk about factors of the effort and effort and concentration has to be properly balanced. You cannot be too excess, too, too less. They say, as long as you have mindfulness, uh, everything will be good. Yeah, that is general speaking. Uh, you know? But specifically speaking, uh, it's been done by the equanimity. As you bring about that equanimity, then your, your concentration effort does not go, it becomes very balanced. Uh, like it's, it, it should be seen over here, it, sh it should be seen as a state of looking with equanimity in the Chitta and Chitta Sika, like a charioteer who looks on with equanimity, equanimity at the thoroughbreds progressing evenly along the roadway. The thoroughbreds means the, the thoroughbred horses. Huh? Now, the, the here is only when you, you have a experience of meditation, especially like in the vipassana, that at a certain level of meditation or certain time of your meditation that you know that this is a great meditation. The whole hour you sit down, no sleepiness, no agitation of mind, the mind can able to notice the object, whatever that it arises very clearly, precisely, nothing in excess, the concentration, nothing in excess, the restlessness doesn't come in, sleepiness all don't come in. Yeah. And you can able to notice things very clearly. Now, if you can remember that particular type of meditation that you have, uh, that you recall it. Now, during that time, this equanimity is at that level that it's conveying all your consciousness and mental factor evenly that you can able to keep on noting one thing after another thing for that whole hour. And this is beautiful. You, can, you sit there for one hour, one hour. You sit there for two hours, two hours. You sit there for three hours, but three hours. Eh? You know? It's beautiful, the, the whole mind at this moment of time. Most of us, when we meditate, eh? it's like when you meditate, after that, sleepiness comes in, after that, the mind clear, and then sleepiness again, then thinking, then sensual desire, then you don't like your... your uh, your neighbor making noise, <laughs> this type of meditation. Then after that, we notice the object just a little bit here and there. So to those who are taking in breath, out breath, also the same thing. It's then you, you're taking in breath, out breath. After a while, everything gone. Oh, gone. 
Oh, I'm doing so well. I'm doing so well. The mind is so calm, so peaceful. Actually, you're not doing anything because that time your mindfulness all gone already. You're almost like a, you're almost like doing nothing eh, at this moment of time. Yeah? So therefore, you need you need that evenness of the mind. So when that mindfulness comes in, when it's strong and it's powerful, eh, it comes in together to where that equanimity that. All you need to do, uh, that mindfulness, uh, when it sees that, uh, what do you call that? Let's say the effort is in balance. Uh, the mindfulness knows that effort is in balance right now because it confronts the effort itself also. Yeah? It confronts the effort and it knows that the effort in the state of too much. Then with that confronting, and therefore, equanimity comes in to do the work of even out that effort, that excess effort. Yeah? To give you an idea what is going on. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but usually, as I said, we just take mindfulness as it is. As the mindfulness is, is there, then this equanimity can't tag along it. Or not. You don't have to be purposely going the purposely go and um, arouse that mindfulness to come, you know, you don't have, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no. arouse the equanimity, you know, you don't have to purposely arouse, go and arouse the equanimity, it, more or less it will come in and it will, it will help you to rebalance the whole thing. Uh, and also, <clears throat> and also it's good that, uh, the next thing is that, when there's an excess, uh, when your mind is in excess of too much of uh, effort or concentration, you're not just only balancing. If it's too much of, of effort, oh, okay, you thought that you just bring up the, uh, the concentration a little bit more to make it balance. Principle, it's okay to talk in principle, you know. But don't forget mindfulness. Huh? If you were to balance your mind, huh? you thought that, oh, too much effort, huh? bring the mindfulness. You, then you forget about mindfulness. You just bring in the concentration. Huh? Your mind can go haywire. Huh? Huh? The mind has to, you want to balance something, the, the mindfulness has to come together. You want to reduce something, the mindfulness has to come together. Uh, and you must know actually how to arouse that mindfulness together with the concentration, for example. And, or, or another time, you are practicing, you must know how to bring about that mindfulness and the effort together. Not just bringing the effort, but not the mindfulness, or bringing the mindfulness bringing the concentration without the mindfulness. The so mindfulness is always crucial. It's the, it's the linchpin over here. Yeah? It's you need to bring those things together. And, and when we come into effort, when you come to mindfulness, we will talk about it. Yeah? We talk about it, how to bring those things both together in order to keep the mind in a state of balance. Yeah? But nevertheless, when the mind is in the state of balance, uh, when your everything is going well, everything is going soon soon, you know, everything is going, your noticing is going well, then here your neutrality is going very, I mean, it's going smoothly. That means that neither deficiency, neither excess. Yeah? Uh, <clears throat> we, we talk until here, yeah? because when that when you come into the faculty, uh, not just mindful, not just this neutrality of mind, you know, there's also other factors involved also, which is a little bit more difficult. Huh? We, we spoke about this thing somewhere. There's a quick Q and A session, I think, by Sister Kelly. You know, somewhere in January or December. You know, there's a Q and A session, and this is this is something that we talk. I also haven't finished writing down it yet. But nevertheless, nevertheless, we're going to talk about these things a little bit in the next talk. Yeah? You, don't have, you don't have to purposely go and arouse these things. Uh. These things will come together with the mindfulness. And therefore, that time uh, you can see that how the mindfulness, 
the flexibility of the mindfulness or the swiftness of the mindfulness or the bendability or the or the easiness of that mindfulness you know those things that starts coming in you can see it for yourself uh. in the beginning aspect of your mindfulness uh, you cannot notice all these type of things you only in, you don't even know what's the characteristic of mindfulness first of all but when you come into the deeper aspect when it connected to this you see that how flexible the mindfulness is and uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit uh. Uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit in the next talk on mindfulness uh, as a faculty all right so okay we we stop here for for tonight yeah <clears throat>